But um, let me just ask you a little bit about DISC. How many of you guys are familiar with DISC, uh, the DISC behavioral tool? Quick show of hands. Okay. You know, um, it's something that we've talked about. We talk about in this company a lot. It's a tool that we, uh, we refer to a lot of times in our training. And uh, I'm going to walk you through it. It's, it's a behavioral assessment tool. Or it's not a psychological test. I'm going to give you a little bit of background in terms of the history of how DISC even came about. But it really helps us kind of look for predictable patterns in people's behavior. One of the things that we know are that people are different. All of us are different. But we're different in predictable ways. And when we learn what those predictable differences are, it helps us to do a better job of communicating and connecting and building relationships and building rapport. So I have um, spent the part of the last couple of years um, really digging deep in this DISC. I, I'm, I'm a certified DISC instructor for the John Maxwell uh, Training and Coaching Organization. And, and, I, and I spend a lot of time helping people kind of think about their own behavioral style and how to identify the behaviors of other folks. And what I'm gonna to do today is we're gonna talk about behavior and we're gonna to try to tie that into real estate and think about how your behavioral style impacts the way you approach growing your business and your lead generation. Sound like a good strategy? All right, so let's get rolling here and I will keep an eye on and see if George joins us. I'm gonna do a screen share here just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Do you guys see my screen? Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Just keep, uh, keep me honest. If it turns out that it doesn't seem like it's tracking along every once in a while lately, um, uh, Zoom has gotten a little bit wonky and we sometimes lose the ability to uh, change slides. So if that happens, just let me know. But um, here's what we want to talk about. Today, we're going to learn about yourself. We're going to learn about others. We're going to learn about what makes each of us unique and really think about the strengths of each behavioral style and, and learn how to improve communication. That's where we're going today. And I want to start with an exercise. Do you guys see this number sheet on the screen? Okay. I'm going to give you a task and I'm going to give you, it's a fun little game that we start out with. And, and I'd like you to just take a look at this sheet. And I'm going to look at the clock that I've got on my desk here that does have a second sweep hand. And what I'm going to do is ask you to go ahead and look at this sheet. And I'm going to ask you to try to identify all of the numbers in sequence. Now, if we were in a, a real room here, I would give you a sheet of paper and ask you to circle the numbers as you see them. But what I'm going to ask you to do is in 45 seconds, I'm going to ask you to find number one. When you find number one, just write it down, put a check mark. When you find number two, put a check mark. And I want to see how many numbers you guys can find in 45 seconds. Everybody clear on what we're going to try to do here? Every, any questions around that? All right, then here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put 45 seconds on the counter. Ready, set, and go. Just about 20 seconds in. Ten more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, drop your pencils. Let me ask you guys, how many people found five numbers? Quick show of hands or put your, your thumb up in chat, whatever we're going to do here. How many people found five at least? Keep your hand up if you found uh, up to ten. Anybody find ten numbers? Anybody find 15 numbers? 15 numbers. Anybody? Yes. Have okay. How about 20? Are we have anybody find as many as 20? Who was it that was at still at 15? What's the high water number here so far? I found 12. 12? Yeah. Okay. 12. Ingrid also. 17. Okay. 12 is a good common number. All right, 18. guys. 18. Good. Congratulations. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to just give me a minute here and I'm gonna just kind of take this sheet and I'm gonna draw it into quadrants here. Mm -hmm. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is just look at the, the quadrants as I kind of do this. If the number one is in the upper top left quadrant, the number two is in the top right quadrant. 
the number three is in the bottom right, the number four is in the bottom left, number five is going to be top left, number six is going to be top right. Wow. Is there a pattern emerging here? Yes. Yeah. See a pattern beginning to take shape, right? <laughs> All right, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to clear the slate. I'm going to give you 45 seconds. Now that you know the pattern, I'm going to ask you to try to do this again and see if you can beat your score. All right, I'm gonna put 45 seconds on the clock. Are you ready, set? Do we start where we were or do we start from one? Right from beginning, right from one. Okay. Start it again. We're 10 seconds in. 16, 17, now I'm doing 18. All right, we're 30 seconds in, 15 more seconds. All right, five, four, three, two, one. All right, let's stop that. Now, quickly answer the question. How many of you improved your score? Quick show of hands. Let's call out some numbers. Let's try to hear. You're all muted right now because I had to mute everybody because of some background noise. But unmute yourself. Let's try to hear some big numbers here. I went from 12 to 19. You went from 12 to 19. Outstanding. Anybody else have a big jump like that? 34. 34. Wow. wow what an overachiever. That's a good number. <laughs> Anybody else have a big jump? I went from 12 to 22. 12 to 22. Anybody else? I went from five to 15 and being dyslexic, that's pretty good. But yeah, you know what? It's really good. And here's the thing, guys. Once you see the pattern and you know what to expect, it kind of changes the way you behave. Would you agree? And so here's the trick. You know, once we see a pattern emerge, we don't really need to see the whole picture, right? If I took a look at that picture, can you imagine what kind of critters are on the other side of those little boxes, right? You see the beginning of the pattern and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that we're looking at a tiger and a Dalmatian and a zebra and a giraffe because we see the pattern and it tells us what to expect. Well, you know, here's the cool thing. You know, people are, are different, but they're different in predictable ways. And when we start to learn the patterns of how they behave, one of the things that we can do is we can think about what kinds of communication to expect from them and how to change our own communication so that we can interact with them at a higher level. And let me ask you this, have you ever met anybody who's just kind of bold and direct and sort of results oriented, they're comfortable being in control? Anybody know anyone like that? That person is probably gonna be wired in a way that we would call sort of that high D, the driver. How about this? You know anybody who's kind of the life of the party? They're fun to be around. They're great storytellers. They're good with jokes. Anybody know some folks like that? Those are gonna be our high eyes, right? They're likely to be wired as a high eye. How about somebody who's, who's a friend who is just loyal? They're, they're dedicated. They're, they're, they're just kind of um, uh, the, the rock of our families in many instances. Anybody know those kind of just rock solid, good people? friend, you know, those are people who are hard, likely to be wired as what we call a high S. And then the detail-oriented folks, how many detail-oriented folks do we have here? They're, they're, they're focused on, they're neat and they're organized and they're well-structured. They, they don't usually seek out crowds. They tend to be a little bit more quiet, a little bit more reserved. Anybody know anyone like that? These are folks who are likely to be what we call high C wired, D-I-S-C, right? Now, here's the thing. When we think about these styles, it's not designed to kind of put you in a box and, and kind of just kind of label you and put you in a box and say, hey, this is who you are and you can never change. The truth is all of us are this kaleidoscope of styles. We have all of these styles in us at all times. It's just that most of us over time tend to lean towards one style or maybe a combination of styles as our dominant styles, right? Not designed to label, not designed to pathologize. Let me give you some history here. You know, since the beginning of time, 444 BC, this good looking dude on the left here, a guy by the name of Empedocles, that's a heck of a great name. You know, what he thought was early on, he thought that, you know, the things that influence people's behavior had to do with the, the elements, the earth and the air 
and fire and water. And that's what he really believed influenced what, cha- what caused people to behave the way that they did. 40 years later, uh, Hipp- Hippocrates in 400 BC said, look, it's not the elements, it's more kind of these internal fluids in our body, right? Things like uh, the, the, the different systems and the fluids. And he, and he came up with labels of behavior that were things like caloric or sanguine or melancholy or phlegmatic. We still refer to people being melancholy, right? As, as just kind of a behavior. It was in 1921 that a guy named Carl Jung, who was a Swiss psychologist, started to take a look at behavior. And he said, look, what we really do is we look at behavior in terms of these categories. There's thinking, there's feeling, there's sensing, there's intuition. And after that, it was Dr. William Martson in 1928, who kind of took that work and kind of really brought us to where we are today, thinking about DISC. And what he says is, look, we take those, those categories. And he wrote this book called The Emotions of Normal People. And I just want you to hear that because these are not pathologies. These are behaviors of normal people. And he categorized them as the discs that we're familiar with today, dominance, influence, steadiness, compliance. So out throughout history, we've been, we've been trying to think about this. It was really Marxism that helped us really get to a place where we could understand it and operationalize it and use it in an easy way. So if we think about behavior as something that kind of comes out of our personality, and I think that's true, you know, for most of us, our personalities really are, are in flux. As kids, as young kids, you think about the personality of a child, you know, it doesn't really crystallize much until early adulthood. But things that influence your personality, which have an impact on your behavior, include things like, you know, your heredity, certainly there's some genetics involved, Uh, um, your environment, certainly the life experiences you have, especially experiences that are particularly emotionally charged, they have a big impact on behavior, as do role models, right? The environmental role models that we have have a lot to do with the way our behavior shows up. And, and if we were to actually do a DISC assessment today, and this is what I do a lot of for, for other organizations, is I do these DISC assessments and then we kind of walk through this. We call it a, a debriefing. We, we kind of ask a series of questions that begins to help us identify which styles are your prominent styles. And we plot them out on this graph. And if you look at the graph, what you see is a continuum with a zero in the middle and it goes up and it goes low. And any behavior that is above this midline is something we would call a dominant behavior. And any behavior that is below the midline, it doesn't mean you don't have it. It just doesn't mean you have it in as much proportion as these other dominant styles, right? And if we were to do a a full disc and debriefing, we'd really do an analysis of how that impacts you and your relationships and your work and, and really help you think through how to use that information to your advantage. But what we're going to do today is recognize that there are a couple of key questions that we can use that really help us to kind of distill this. And let me just, let me do it this way. I want you to do an example with me. I want you to pretend that we're standing in an office building and the elevator shows up. Now, I want you to think about this. As the doors are beginning to open, are you the person who secretly hopes, please, God, please, God, please, God, let this elevator be empty. I don't want to talk or see anyone. And, and you just kind of want to get on that elevator and just push the button for your floor and look down at your feet and, and just don't want to make eye contact or have any conversation with anyone. Does anybody kind of feel that that's kind of their elevator stance? Quick show of hands. Anybody feel that way? Okay. I see a couple of folks. You know, the truth is that that would probably make you somewhat of a reserved person. And then there's the other group of folks, right? The elevator shows up and they're like, oh, baby, it's party time. I can't wait to see who's on the elevator because I'm going to have a conversation. We're going to talk. I'm going to get, I'm going to make a new friend. Anybody look at the elevator door opening as an opportunity to have a conversation? Quick show of hands. Okay. A couple of people, I see some nods. I see some sort of lukewarm. Look, if that describes you, then you would be more on the outgoing continuum, right? Now, a different question. Let's pretend you're going on vacation. And I really hope that COVID clears up and the weather clears up and we can start to get out and travel a little bit more. But now it's vacation time. Are you the person who is kind of focusing on all the things that need to be done, making sure that we've got the hotel reservations, the cars reserved, all the different things that need to be done so everyone can have a good time? 
anybody take that role on in vacation planning? Okay, I see some hands there. If you if that describes you, then you are likely to be sort of task oriented, right? And if you're the person who's like, we're going on vacation, I don't really care. We'll figure it out when we get there. I don't even know where I just take me to the airport and I'll see what planes are going. I'll pick a spot. And when we get there, we're just going to have fun. Anybody kind of maybe not that dramatically, but anybody not so concerned about the details, let's just get there. We'll figure it out when we get there. Anybody more like that? Yeah. That would put us on more of a sort of a people-oriented, relationship-oriented. We're more thinking about what we're going to do and who we're going to do it with, right? And so when we think about DISC, what happens is, you know, with just a couple of key questions, we can determine whether we're more people-oriented or task-oriented. With another key question, we can figure out whether we're more outgoing or more reserved. And the truth is DISC breaks down into just these ways. The Ds and the Is tend to be our more outgoing personalities. The Cs and the Ss tend to be our more reserved personalities. The Ds and the Cs tend to be more detail-oriented and task-oriented. And the Is and the Ss tend to be a little bit more people-oriented, right? That's kind of how these continue and break down. Remember, we're a kaleidoscope of these all the time. It's not that we're just one or, or whatever. But, but, but we, we have these two main continuum. Are we outgoing or reserved? Are we people-oriented? Are we task-oriented? And that's what the DISC assessment helps us to figure out. So let's explore them a little bit. Let's start with the high Ds. Now, here's how you know that you're, you're, you're around a high D, right? A high D, here's how you know you're communicating with a high D. You talk about, let's go out to have lunch. And you agree to go to have lunch. And the high D insists on driving even though it's your car, that's the ID. They are driven, they are decision makers, they are action oriented, right? They're, 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 if you think about that continuum, they're task oriented, right? And let's think about the high, uh, the Ds. They make up about 3% of the population. Really only 3% of the population is predominantly high D, meaning that's exclusively what they are. You know, I think, I think God in God's infinite wisdom said, you know what, we need these high Ds. They're good decision makers. They get things done. But my gosh, if we have too many of them, we're going to be at war all the time. So let's just keep it toned down to just not too many of them, right? The high Ds, they seek control. They're decisive. They're direct. They're results oriented, right? That's the behaviors that you would see with high D behaviors. And let's think about the high I's now. Think about someone in your family or friends, a colleague who's just, just fun to be around, right? They, they, they tell great stories. That person's probably the high I wired and they make up about 11% of the population. They tend to be persuasive. They tend to be spontaneous. They're super friendly. They love the spotlight. It might not surprise anyone on the Zoom call that I'm a high I because I love to be in front of the Zoom camera all day, every day. I just love to be on, right? That's a high I trait. Let's think about the high S's now. You think about a person who's loyal, they're helpful, they're great team members, they're reliable, they're always there on a bad day. You think about the day that you're having a funky bad day, you pick up the phone and you've got that great friend who can just kind of, can kind of put that big hug around you. Anybody have that kind of a friend, you know you can always call on a bad day and they'll make you feel good that's probably a pretty high S. Now, here's why you wouldn't call a high I. And I, I, I hate to kind of say this about myself, but here's what happens when you call a high I with your bad day. Hey, Hal, you know what? I just got to talk, man. I got to vent. I'm having a bad day. This has happened. That happened. The other thing happened. Well, what do high eyes want? They want to be in the spotlight. So we're likely to say, oh, I'm sorry you had such a bad day, but you should hear how bad my day was. You're like, wait a minute. That's, that's not, I didn't, I didn't call for that. I want to be the one getting attention here. The high S's make up about 69% of the population. The vast majority of the earth is filled with high S's. They're team oriented. They're steady. They're great with follow through. They're loyal. They're friendly. They're accepting. 69% are the high S's. And then our detail oriented friends, the high C's, this is clearly my lowest trait. They're, if you look at their homes, everything is in the garage is kind of neatly hung up. All the tools are in the right spot. There's never a thing out of order. Um, 
you know, the tools might even have little label spots on it that says rake goes here, shovel goes here, right? These are our friends who are the high C's and they make up about 17% of the population. They're compliant, they're analytical, they're great planners, they're detail oriented, right? And so again, these are the 40,000 foot view sort of descriptions of the kinds of behaviors that you see in these different styles, the D, I, S, and C. But let's go a little bit deeper. Let's go back to the Ds, 3% of the population, right? Here's what we know. They tend to be driven and they, they tend to like authority. They tend to gravitate to leadership roles. A lot of, every one of your team leaders is, is a very strong D and you have to be a strong D in order to be effective in that role, right? They take control easily. They like to be in control. They embrace changes that will help them get results. They're very comfortable being direct. They don't beat around the bush. And to some extent, they want action. It's ready, fire, aim with the high Ds. That's the kind of behavior that we see, right? Sometimes you know you're talking to a high D because before you finished your thought, they've interrupted you or they're moving on. Or they kind of let you know that they're done with the conversation because as you're still talking, they begin to get up and head to the door. We can sometimes interpret that as rude and many people do, right? We'll talk about strengths and weaknesses in a little bit, but that's just the way that folks are wired. There's a little bit of a Mr. Magoo quality to the high D, if you remember the old cartoon, where the beginning of the cartoon shows Mr. Magoo who can't see, he's blind, he's driving his car, and while he thinks he's driving fine, he's running everybody else off the road. Chickens are flying up in the air and all those things, and high Ds are a little bit like that. They're a little bit like being in the pathway of a tornado. And it's not that they don't care about people, that's just not their primary focus, right? That's the high D. And you know, here's the greatest fear that the high Ds have. The biggest fear of the high D is they do not want to be taken advantage of, right? That's their biggest fear. And we think about this, and it's important that we think about this with our clients. Because let me tell you, what we know is that logic gets people to think, it's emotions that get people to take action. And fear is the most uh, predictive emotion of all. The things that we're most afraid of are going to drive our actions more than anything else. And when we're working with a high D client, what we know is their biggest fear is don't take advantage of me. Don't waste my time. How do we help them make sure that they feel like they're in control? Here's the strengths. Great strengths of these high Ds. They're bold, right? They're, they're, they're confident. They're very decisive. They're productive. They, they're great in emergencies. They motivate other people to take action. They're goal-oriented. They've got great, comfortable leading skills. They, they thrive when, the, when things get tough. These are great characteristics of, and strengths of the high Ds. And to some extent, why we need them in our leadership roles. Now, here's some of the challenges. They can be a little argumentative at times. They can be a little bit um, opinionated. They're not always quick with compliments. Not that they don't care about people, but it's just not something that occurs to them. We're just talking about getting the task done. I don't need to stroke your ego. They, they come off sometimes as a little impatient, a little insensitive, a little unforgiving. They sometimes appear to be a little bit cold and a little bit aloof. And that's just the behavior, the way that it shows up. One of the things that we need to be clear of when we look at behavior is behavior isn't good, it isn't bad, it just is right? And when we learn that, that this is somebody who just doesn't ever seem to apologize, they never ever seem to kind of try to make me feel better. It's just the way they're wired, right? So when we think about the, you know, the, the, the high Ds, and I'm just kind of highlighting all these different behaviors, and we think now about lead generation, because I said I was going to bring this back to lead gen. What we know is that lead generation is a combination of prospecting and marketing, right? We know that both are lead generation. And one of the things that I teach in the Ignite classes and really try to drive home is that if you think that lead generation is only prospecting, you are making a tragic mistake in your business because it's not. We have to lead. It's prospecting based, right? but it's gotta be enhanced by our marketing. The marketing that we do makes our prospecting more effective. And when we look at the base here, prospecting, it's, it tends to be more proactive, more, more direct, more immediate results. It tends to require our time more than our dollars. Whereas marketing, 
tends to be a little bit more money intensive, right? It tends to create a brand awareness, which kind of guarantees that we have better long-term results. I like to think of, of marketing in some ways as preparing the soil to plant. My, my wife and I are gardeners. And one of the things that I've learned the hard way is that you can spend a lot of money on some wonderful plantings and put them in the ground. But if you haven't prepared the soil well, those plants will not thrive. They won't bloom, they won't live. You have to prepare the soil. The marketing prepares the community to get ready for our message so that when we show up in person as a prospector, we have better results. There is this thing in social psychology that we call the, uh, the mere exposure effect. And it's based on the law of familiarity that says the more I get exposed to something, the more comfortable I become with it. Anybody know big Rob Dukansky? Rob sells NJ.com. Yeah, have you seen his face on a billboard, on a bus? I mean, he is everywhere. And one of the things that Rob, and I don't know what that costs him, but it's got to cost him a fortune. One of the things that I know, though, is that the more you see someone again and again and again and again and again, you begin to feel like you know who he is. And there's a place in social psychology where exposure through repetition turns into preference. I not only feel comfortable with you because I've seen you so much, but I think if I had a choice, I'd pick you over somebody else because you're just so comfortable that I, I, I pick you. That's important part of our lead gen. We cannot not market, but we've got to be prospecting based. And so if you go back and think about high Ds and you think about their style, the way we described it, what kind of lead generation do you think they would excel in? The prospecting side, sort of that face-to-face -face FISBO call, circle prospecting, really getting out there in the community, or the marketing side, or, or maybe both. But where do you think their strengths would be? What would be in the wheelhouse of a high D? Anybody? Someone unmute and, and give, me a, give me an answer here. The prospecting side. Yeah, for sure, right? The high Ds, they're like, look, just let me have at it. Now, here's the thing. Only 3% of the population is, is, is super high D. And as you think about, if we're only going to define lead generation as picking up the phone and cold calling strangers, what I can tell you is that there's an awful lot of folks that ain't wired for that. That's not to say that you can't do it. We'll talk about style flex in a moment. But what I can say is that any time that you flex out of your natural behavioral style, it's going to cause stress. You can do it, but you can only do it for so long. Think about it this way. You can have a, a, a Volkswagen Jetta and you can have a Maserati. And you can get both of those cars to go 100 miles an hour. The difference is the Maserati will run 100 miles an hour all day as long as there's fuel in the tank because it was built to do that. The Volkswagen Jetta is going to explode at some point because it was never built to do that. And that's what happens to us as well. When we try to do things outside of our strengths, outside of our styles, if we're not careful, we can kind of create a level of stress that kind of causes us to explode. And, and how does that show up? It shows up in bad decisions. It shows up in not eating well. It shows up in not sleeping well. Sleeping well. It shows up in drinking too much. It shows up in infidelities. It shows up in lots of terrible ways. Right, but that's what happens when we try to step too far out of our strength zones, right? We can do it sometimes, but then we've got to kind of go back in and, and retool. I, I always say, and I have a, a, a saying that I love, and we've all heard this, you know, the magic happens on the other side of your comfort zone. Has anybody ever heard that before? Yeah, it does. It really does. We have got to kind of be willing to be uncomfortable in order to have great results, we've got to be willing to do things that don't come easily. That said, while the great results always happen on the other side of your comfort zone, they never happen on the other side of your strengths. If you step outside of your strengths zone, you will not only be uncomfortable, but you will also be ineffective. And that leads to terrible outcomes. So one of the goals is to really get clear on what's your style and start to think about what lead generation style is gonna work for me. Now know that the ones that are more outgoing are the, and, and the ones who are more comfortable taking risk 
and putting themselves in a situation and not really caring if people are, are, are offended and they don't really care what people think about them, right? They are probably going to generate results faster than folks who are strictly marketing based, certainly, or, or people who are really kind of laid back and, and don't, they know they should be making calls, but they don't make the volume of calls because they're just not that outgoing or, or whatever. That's not to say you won't succeed. You just won't succeed as quickly. I had a mentor who hired me actually went into Keller Williams it was a guy by the name of Sean Rawls was the regional director years ago when I first came on as a team leader. And he used to say about lead generation, he says, you know, what every agent just needs to realize is that they need to go to the store and buy a pair of high D pants. And every day they need to put the high D pants on for a couple of hours and do the high D activities that grill their business. And then they can take those high D pants off again and chill out, right? That's really, really true for a lot of us, myself included, right? Let's look at the high eyes. They seek friendly environments. They're always active. They're very relationship oriented. They're emotional. They're animated. They are great storytellers. They're very encouraging. They're very motivating. They treasure relationships and experiences probably more than anything else. You know what the biggest fear is of a high eye? It's, it's the fear of rejection. It's the fear of rejection. They love to be on stage because they love to be the center of attention. A lot of great performers are high eyes. A lot of creatives are high eyes. I have a friend of mine who's a chef and a very, very good one. And he is a very high eye because I had an opportunity to do his disc. And you know, here's one of the funny things that happens. He opened up a restaurant not too long ago. Well, before COVID, I guess. But he opened up a restaurant and it did very, very well. But in the early reviews that came out, Despite the fact that he had 99% wonderful critical reviews, he had one reviewer who didn't like his food. And that's the thing that he hung on. He just couldn't let it go, right? It is kryptonite to high eyes, the fear of rejection, right? And when we know that about our clients, one of the things that we need to do is make sure that not only do they feel that we're not getting frustrated with them or pushing them away, but that the decisions that they make are going to be appreciated by the people in their world, right? That's a really critical thing to help an eye, eye make a decision. So let's look at their strengths. They're persuasive, they're generous, they're charismatic, they're social, spontaneous, friendly. They're probably the kid who got that, you know, thing from school that said talks too much in class. That's probably a high eye. Um, they love the spotlight, right? They're likable, they're optimistic. Here's some of the downsides. They can be a little, well, needing the spotlight can be a downside. It's kind of like I said, you know, you call up a high S when you're having a bad day, not a high I, because a high I needs the spotlight. It's going to be their bad day. That's important, not yours, right? They're a little bit unfocused. They're a little bit undisciplined. They're, they, they tend to be disor disorganized. They can be a little bit naive. And sometimes that naivete comes from the fact that they are so optimistic and they always want to see the good in others. And sometimes that leads them to being just a little bit too naive. They can sometimes come off as feeling too phony, too rah-rah. You know, they're easily distracted. They can be impulsive. They can be forgetful. I have learned that if I don't take notes, and right by my desk here, I've got my binder that says notes. And every day, I have to write notes for myself because I know, I promise you guys, I'll do things. And I will forget if I don't put it in here. That's just the way I'm wired, unfortunately. So I have to build systems to try to prevent that. You know, they talk too much sometimes. They waste time. They don't always listen, right? They're not good. They overcommit. They, they don't always follow through. We're not always dependable on getting things done because we're always so excited to follow that next thing that we don't finish tasks easily. That's not a great characteristic of a high I, but it is a true one. And so we think about the high I's and we think about lead generation and we start to say, okay, what would be the kinds of lead gen that would work well with a high eye. They're, they're outgoing. They're people-oriented more than task-oriented. What kinds of lead generation activities would kind of fall naturally into that? Any thoughts? Maybe like running events, mm. like hosting events. Hosting events would be great. You can be in the front of the room and you can be the moderator and you can meet people. That's a great one for a high eye. Anyone else? Guys, I built my business as a high eye in the back of open houses. $10 million closed in my first year on the back of open houses. 
because for me, it was a party and I love parties, man. That's, and then, you know what, also to Raj's point, I also got, you know, because there's a little bit of a teacher in me, obviously, I also started to pick up on events and we did seminars, buyer seminars, investor seminars. That's the way I met people. And it was a great leveraged way to get folks into my database that lined up perfectly with the behavioral styles of the high I. Let's think about the S's. 69% of the population, they, they, they're, they're loyal, they're easygoing, they're agreeable, they're even paced, they're good listeners, they're compassionate. You know what the biggest fear of the high S is, is the loss of security is, 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 and, and confrontation. They hate confrontation and they don't like things to be unpredictable. And you know, it's interesting because years ago in high pressure sales, and I, and I don't see real estate as high pressure sales. I see it as high contact sales. But years ago, we, we, the, the sales professional characteristic was described as just this high D, high I. If you were not outgoing and super people oriented and a risk taker, you weren't going to make it in sales. That was the, the characteristic sort of became that, that used car salesman persona, right? Sometimes comes off as a little bit phony, a little bit fake. And, and what's happened over time is, especially in real estate, is we have had a lot of other blends of personality types, behavioral styles show up into sales. High S's are not risk takers. They don't like confrontation. They don't like to put themselves out there in a position where, where things are unpredictable. To get into a commission-based business is inherently unpredictable. And, and we would start to say, gee, how does a high S succeed in that kind of an environment? Well, the way that they do it is they learn how to lead generate in a way that fits their style and to try to create some predictability. High S's need systems in place because they know that with systems, things become predictable. The problem with high S's is that on that continuum of people and task, they're way over on the people side and systems are way over on the task side. It doesn't come naturally, but it's something we have to learn how to do right? Some great strengths for the high S's. They're hard workers, they're team players, they're stable, steady. They, they're, they're great listeners. They're faithful. They build close relationships and people love to have them around, you know, but they can be too laid back sometimes. Sometimes the situation requires you to put your high D pants on for a little bit. Sometimes when they feel that they're being challenged because they don't like confrontation, they can be really snarky. High S's can be super snarks. You know, they, they don't like change. And in fact, they, they don't, it's not that they won't make change, but they have to see what's in it for them and they have to know that it won't be too disruptive or they're going to resist, right? They're, they have a hard time saying no to people because they don't like the confrontation, right? And, and they need reassurance. They're, they're not always super direct. They can be possessive. They can be a little bit indecisive and they may not speak up and tell you what's really going on, what they're really thinking if we don't solicit it, right? That's the high S's. <clears throat> and again, the task then is to kind of figure out, I'm gonna get back into my screen share because my clicker just stopped. Uh, righty, hold on, there you go. What's the right lead generation style for the S's? What's the right blend of prospecting and marketing that's not too in your face, but sometimes they need to put on their high D pants and get a little bit more proactive, right? What does that look like so that they can get enough leads consistently into their funnel so that their income stream becomes predictable enough that they don't freak out? Because the roller coaster ride of I've got money, I don't have money, I've got money, I don't have money chases the high S's right out of this industry every time, every time. Systems putting, you know, style flexing into your lead generation, keeping that funnel filled so that you've got predictable lead flow will keep you in the business if you're high eye. Absent that, it's just a matter of time. And I don't mean to be Debbie Downer here. I'm just being real, right? Systems are things that we can teach you to do, right? The high Cs, they're great. They, they seek an environment that's logical and factual. They're compliant, they're conscientious, they're accurate, they're detail-oriented. Their biggest fear is criticism. I don't want to be criticized for making a mistake. And so I may not decide until I have all the facts. That's why I need facts. Because if I don't have facts, I'm likely to make a bad decision. If I make a bad decision, you might be mad at me. And they don't want to be criticized. 
And, and it's hard for the high Ds in their world to have high Cs around because the high D is ready, fire, aim. The high C is ready, aim, 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 aim. Let's set the sights adjust one more time. And the Ds are like, damn it, would you fire? You're killing me here, right? And it causes tension. It causes tension sometimes. But the key is they don't want to get it wrong, right? Their strengths, they're analytical, they're great planners, they're data-driven, they're idealistic, all these wonderful traits that can lead to like any trait that's overused is an obstacle. They can sometimes prefer to just do it myself. They can be hard to please, right? They, they can be a little bit insecure in social environments. They can sometimes be a little bit rigid and they overanalyze. And, and, and because they're task-oriented and not people-oriented like the Ds, they tend to sometimes come off as a little bit cold and distant and maybe don't always see the big picture and maybe don't want to take a risk until they can really mitigate it. You know, it might surprise you to know that Richard Branson is a pretty high C. Virgin Airlines, space, all this stuff. And here's the thing. It's not that you don't take risks. But, but, but Richard Branson is one who always, always, always analyzes the downside before he does anything because he knows that things can go wrong and he doesn't want things to go wrong. And as big an outgoing kind of life that he has, he does it by being a very high C, which is interesting. As we cruise along here, we go back to the lead generation. And again, once again, my clicker seems like it's stuck. So stick with me here for a second. Oh, there we go. We got to think about what are the things that are going to really work for the high C's, right? They're not going to be comfortable taking risk and getting on the phone and making these cold calls, but they could be really good at providing great factual information in a controlled environment like Hal's weekly real estate update YouTube channel, where I get all the facts and the figures and the data that people need to know. And in a recording that I can control, get that out there that could be a great lead generation strategy of how you meet people and how you play within your own strengths. Everyone has strengths. The goal is to figure out what yours are. Now, we do have to style flex, like I said. We do have to. Only 3% of the population is Ds and only 13% or 14% of the population is Is. That means 17% of the population is outgoing enough to kind of do naturally the kind of prospecting that really thrives in a sales environment. That's 17%. That means 83% of us need to style flex. And, and we need to learn how to do it and then go back and retool, right? I'm going to do it for an hour a day. I'm going to stretch that to an hour and a half a day. I'm going to stretch to two hours a day. And then I'm going to go do something nice for myself and recharge the batteries because that was hard. And that's the nature of the beast, right? Not only do we lead generate and style flex into, into our lead generation styles, but we also have to flex into our communication styles. I'm going to spend the last 15 minutes here just talking about communication. John Maxwell talks about how connecting increases your influence when you can connect with people in a way that they can hear you, you're going to be much more influential. And it's interesting because how many of us have like a, a, an Alexa or a Siri in your house where you can sort of say, hey, hey, Google or hey, Alexa, right? And it can do really cool things, right? It can do tasks for you. Hey, my daughter has one and she has it turn on the lamp and uh, you know, turn on the timer for the kitchen. And when you ask Alexa to do something, she does it and she always responds back. And it doesn't matter who's making the ask. Does it matter if I say, Alexa, turn on the lamp? Does it matter if Emily says, turn on the lamp? Either one of us can turn on the lamp with any style of language and emotion that we choose. She's always going to do the task and respond back exactly the same way. And that's great if you're a machine. Not so good if you're a person. Not so good if you're a person. If you're a person, what we have to do is we have to recognize that people are different. They're different in predictable ways. But in kindergarten, we learned something that said, it was called the golden rule. There was a great book by Robert Fulham years ago that said, everything I needed to learn in life, I learned in kindergarten. And do we remember what the golden rule says? Do unto others, who can fill that out for me? Do unto others as, who was, who was in kindergarten with me that knows that rule? Do unto others as what? As you would want them, them to do unto, do unto you. 
Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. Treat people the way you would want to be treated. And that's just such a simple, practical, kindergarten level, but man, if we can only do it, way to live. But if you really want to communicate, that's not it. If you really want to lead, that's not it. Because the golden rule says, treat other people the way that we would want to be treated, which implies that everybody gets treated the way I want, which doesn't allow for any of their own uniqueness. I had a boss one time and a very powerful high D off the charts high D. It was tough to work for this guy because he was like a tornado. And he just simply said, that's the cost of being here. We are a very successful company. If you're going to be in my world, you're just going to have to learn that this is who I am, like it or lump it. And man, that is old school leadership. That is not the way leaders lead anymore. Today, what leaders recognize is that if they really want to lead, they have to change themselves to really influence the people around them and bring out and cultivate and nurture the styles of the people around them to help elevate people to play their best game. And, and if the leader can kind of be that adaptive coach and bring out the best in the people around them, now you've got success. That's what new leadership looks like. And the platinum rule says, don't do unto others as you would want to be treated. Do unto others as they want to have done unto themselves, which means treat them the way that they want, which means we have to think about their style. And so if we're communicating with a D, we know that they're quick to the point, they're results oriented. Here's the thing, you gotta be brief. You gotta be brief. I'm a high I. Al Donahue, who I love dearly, is a high D. I send emails to Al Donahue. If they're more than like five, two lines, he ain't gonna read it. I know that because that's just the way high Ds are. Be brief, be direct and to the point, and then stop. Ask what questions that they can answer, not how questions that expect them to, to kind of get into deep processes. The Ds are just quick, reflexive decision makers. And, and the how doesn't, they don't want to really explain it. It's more what questions. Focus on results. Don't ramble. Get to your point. Discuss a problem and its effects on the outcomes. Help them feel in control. This is what we need to do with our high Ds. When we're dealing with a high D in a listing presentation, let's not spend a lot of time trying to butter them up. It's going to, in fact, that will annoy the hell out of them. You start talking about, you see a picture of their grandkids on the wall and you start talking about their family and their grandchildren and their trips to Utah. The high Ds are going to be really agitated. Get to the point, help them understand how it's relevant to them and move on, right? Communicating with a, a high I. Remember, they want to be on stage, not you. Prompt them with questions and let them go for a while. That's how they feel great. And what I'm going to tell you is, if you can ask them questions, not to just talk about facts and figures and stuff, but if you can ask them to talk about things that are important to them, things that are relevant, it actually is a, is a fascinating study that came out of the University of Miami about probably 15 years ago now that talks about the fact that when we, when we engage people and ask them to talk about their own experiences and then actively listen, it causes them to, to feel special, right? Everybody has a sign on their back that says, make me feel special. If you can make people feel special, you will never have a problem in your lead generation business, right? Maya Angelou said years ago, people will forget what you did. They'll forget what you said, but they will never forget what, how you made them feel. And so what we have learned about high eyes is when we can engage them in conversations that let them talk about things that matter to them and we listen intently, it actually triggers a release of dopamine in their brains, which is, it's just this kind of addictive thing. It's like, I can't get enough, man. I just love talking to you. And you would be wise in the beginning of your listing presentation with a high eye to ask those kinds of specific questions that give them an opportunity to talk about things that are important to them and engage them and build rapport around that. Don't ignore their ideas. Allow enough time for socializing. If you're a high D, this is where you're going to have to style flex because you're just going to want to get to the point and you got to let them go. You got to let them talk. Help them see how their decisions are going to be valued by other people. Follow up with the details in writing because high I's are notoriously low C's typically. They're not detail oriented. And so if you have a plan, 
and you've got it laid out, follow up in writing with your high eyes or they're going to miss it. They're not going to follow those details. Sometimes shorter and more frequent interactions are better with high eyes than longer ones, right? Much better than longer ones. Three quick, short emails, probably better than one big tome. I've learned that in my communications with the high B leadership in this organization, right? High S's, when you're communicating with them, create a friendly tone for discussion. What do they not like? They don't like conflict, right? And, you know, I, I've been talking to a bunch of agents in my office hours recently who are struggling because they're running buyers who aren't doing what it takes to do to win in a multiple bid situation. And they're getting frustrated. And, and a lot of it is because you've got buyers who are, who are high S's and they're high I's and they're afraid and they don't like this unpredictability and, they're, and they hunker down. And some of us as agents are getting frustrated. You can't let that bleed through. You cannot let that show because the moment that they feel that sense of conflict from you and your body language in the vibe that's coming, that relationship goes off the rails, right? Don't be overly aggressive. Minimize the potential for uncertainty. Have systems in place. And here's what the high S's are going to need. Every single communication is going to be need to be built around. Here's what happens next. Here's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to call you on Thursday. We're going to do this, this, and this. And then on Thursday, you call up and say, hey, as I said, I was going to call today. We're going to do this, this, and this. And then when that conversation ends, what happens next? The high S's need people to clearly delineate all the steps in the process and what they should expect from you. And when you live up to it consistently, what they begin to see in you is that even in unpredictable times, you are a predictable person. And that's what helps you form a relationship. When you've got that outgoing message on your voicemail that says, I check my voicemail between 11 o'clock and then again at four o'clock. And if it's after seven, you'll get a message the next business day. If I drop a message on your voicemail at 9 a.m., when do I expect to hear from you? Right around 11 o'clock. And if you don't do it, I begin to see you as an unpredictable person, right? And, I, and, 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 and it compromises your relationship, right? Communicating with the high C's, provide lots of details, provide lots and lots of details because they're going to ask you for them and they're going to challenge you on them. Where did you get that stat, right? Uh, I don't believe that stat. They're going to, you know, they need to have the valid facts so that they can make a good decision so that they're not criticized. That's the key for the C's. Be precise, be very specific and be patient and ask, is there any more information that you need? What information, what additional information would be helpful? right? That's the thing that they're going to need to hear from us. And it really helps us to build these effective relationships. Guys, some of us um, in family reunion last week, if you were in family reunion, you heard a lot of discussion about Zillow, a lot of discussion about things that we all saw coming because we know that Zillow was started by Rich Barton and we saw what he did when he got into and created Experian. And, um, um, we saw what he did in the travel industry, right? And we saw what he did to disintermediate the, the real estate agent. And even though he said, no, 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 that's not what I want to do in real estate, we knew where it was going. And here's the thing that I'm getting to. What we know now is that Zillow is now a full-fledged brokerage. They're no longer just a technology company. They're a brokerage with agents and brokers, just like any other company in this space. And what we know is that they have a mortgage company that makes it super easy for people to get financing right? What we know is that they just purchased showing time. The software that every agent schedules their showings on is now owned by Zillow. And what we all believe, and I heard uh, James Shaw yesterday say, if some of you guys know James Shaw from Pivot on Facebook, I heard him say yesterday, and I believe he's spot on, that by the end of this year, you should probably expect a scenario where consumers can go online and they can see a home for sale and they can see a button that says, do you want to see this home? And you click on that button and says, yes, I do. And then the showing time calendar opens up and you pick that time. And then you click the time that works for you. And then Zillow turfs that lead off and sells it to somebody for 40% referral fee. And it ain't you. That's probably what we're going to see before the end of this year. And that terrifies a lot of folks. And, 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 it, and, it, and it should be a wake up call for a lot of folks but it shouldn't terrify anyone who's got a legitimate relationship because 
I do believe, and I heard James say this the other day, and I think he's spot on. People will not click into an appointment and have a stranger show them a home when they've got a relationship with an agent who is their agent. You know, there's driverless cars in the country. There's places right now where you can get into a driverless car and you can just get in there, take me to the airport and the car will take you through. I think that's, there's a certain percentage of people who, who, who feel comfortable doing that. But I think if they had a choice and a good friend said, hey, I'll be happy to drive you to the airport, I think most people would have a friend drive them. My point is technology is disruptive. It always has been and it always will be. And in businesses that are smart enough to get out in front of anticipating what that disruption looks like and insulate themselves for it are the businesses that survive. And what I'm gonna tell you is, is what will help you survive the technology disruption in real estate is relationships. It's the strength and the nature and the quality of the relationships of the people in your world. And DISC and understanding DISC and understanding how to connect with people in this way and communicate differently in this way strengthens the relationships in ways that make it so that your database is not threatened by Zillow because they've got a relationship with you, a real person who lives the platinum rule, not just the golden rule, who makes them feel special, who understands how to communicate with them in a way that they feel heard and understood and valued. Guys, this is important. It's not just important to think about my own style and how do I lead generate what are the things that naturally work well for my style and then lean in heavily. Yes, we do need to do that. And for most of us, we're going to have to get a pair of the high D pants because only the, the high D's and the high I's, 17% of the population are wired for that. The other 87% of us need to style flex and stretch and do something that is uncomfortable. And we know it's going to be uncomfortable. Now, here's the thing. Anybody who's done yoga, anybody who's, done, who's exercised knows that you stretch long enough and consistently enough and you learn that it doesn't hurt anymore. Right? It doesn't learn to hurt anymore. You just learn how to do it better. And that skill does develop. And now we get back into the magic never happens outside. It never happens outside of your skill set. Now that behavior becomes part of your skill set through repetition. But but I, I'm, I'm begging folks to just put on the high defense a little bit, stretch a little bit more, just a little bit more. I want you all to be in this business five years from now. I know that not all of you will. And that, that saddens me because I want you to succeed in this. But you will build relationships that will stick with you to the end of time if you follow these DISC principles. If you understand, you start to think about who am I talking to? What are their greatest fears? How do I alleviate that? How do I communicate with them in a way that builds connection, that they feel understood, that they feel valued? The platinum rule is I change myself to accommodate your need. And that's how we build great relationships. People ask me, and we're going to close with this, what's the best style? The best style is your style. There is no better style. The best style is your style when you learn how to play inside your own strengths and your own game, right? That's the truth. Because I have seen people of every stripe, high Ds, high Is, high Ss, high Cs, I have seen them crush it. Absolutely crush it. Some of you know Ben Kinney. Ben Kinney, who is one of the biggest rock stars in our company. He is the most high DC person in the world. He is not a people person. And you start to think, and I'm telling you, you meet the guy and I love him to death. You meet him, he, he doesn't make eye contact. He kind of looks at his shoes. He's socially uncomfortable. And people say, how does a guy like that succeed in such a people oriented business? He does it because he builds great systems and he hires people who've got social skills. That's how he does it. And he'd be the first to tell you, right? What's the right style, your style? Learn it. Learn how to develop it. Learn how to play within it. Learn how to recognize other folks. Learn how to adapt. And you do all those things, you're going to have a great business, guys. Once we know the pattern, we know what to expect, right? So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Give me a couple of ahas. Any takeaways? Any questions? Any thoughts? I have a question. But uh, Hal, so uh, let's just say uh, a high D reaches out to us. Um, how do we accommodate that personality? And I found that they want, they want what they want when they want it. So 
the system when that and when that call comes in is to accommodate provide them what they want which is probably to schedule an appointment and then pre-qualify compared to let's say an i that calls us and let's yeah. say that the i contacts us and then we have to set if we can identify that they're an i and all they want to do is talk about the story of their life we have to set the boundary that we have to limit the conversation from the get-go or else they're going to keep us on the line forever and a half so yeah great what, question ron you know so Go ahead. Yeah, you touched upon it a little bit about accommodating personalities because identifying is the first step. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, identifying and then accommodation. I think it's even harder. Yeah, it is. That's, Ron. that's where the conversion is. That's where the money gets made. And here's the thing. What do we know about high Ds? High Ds, their biggest fear is being taken advantage of and wasting their time. That's why they don't want to be pre-qualified. Just show me the house. I want you to just do it now. And that's the nature of a high D. And our task is to figure out how do we communicate with them that by doing it a different way, they get to achieve their goal of getting what they want in the market without being taken advantage of better than just rushing in. And, and it takes, it's an art form. It takes time. You know, one of the things that you really get into with the high Ds is back into all of this other forms of communication, the mirroring and the matching and all those other things that are so necessary to build quick rapport because you don't have a lot of time with the high Ds before they lose interest. They are the most challenging. Now, the good news is it's only about 3% of the population. What you get a lot of times in sales is people putting on their high D pants because they think that's the way they need to behave in order to interact with a salesperson. And the truth of the matter is that many times that's a facade. But for the true high Ds, the goal is to help them understand that by, by slowing things down and doing things a different way, they will be more in control of the outcomes that they want, which is really at the genesis of what's driving their fears. And, it, and I wish I could tell you it was easy. You know, the other thing for you, Ron, and, and your team is, is have a massive value proposition because that will cause people to see the value in flexing their own skills. And you guys have got that. So, so kudos to you. I also think um, when you pre-qualify somebody and you ask them, please tell me about your home, you can kind of figure out what they are um, sure. from the answer to that question. Oh, absolutely. If they're like, if they're like you're, oh, you could see the listing is three bed and two bath. But if they're like, oh, one bedroom is 20 feet by 30, you know what I mean? Yeah, sure. Or they, t or they describe it in, in different, more emotional ways. Oh, it's a beautiful, but it's got great scenes and great views and all that stuff that you could start to get a feel. Now, here's the thing though. And, and I would throw that out there in terms of how you ask. One of the things that happens is nobody, especially the, the relationship oriented folks, they don't like to be interrogated, right? And, and just a, a good trick on this, because we know that two thirds of the population, almost 70% leads with S, right? Their biggest fear is they don't like things to be unpredictable. They, they don't like to make changes unless they understand why. Context and permission when we ask questions that are intrusive with them, we give them the context for why we're asking the question and then we honor them enough to ask permission to ask the question. And it sounds like this, you know what Raj, it's really important to know um, that we'll have enough proceeds of sale at the conclusion of this transaction so that you can pay off all the liens on the property and actually transfer the deed. Would it be okay with you if I asked you a kind of a personal question about your finances? Right, context and permission greases the skids for someone like a high S who says, okay, I'm willing to do it because now I understand why, now I understand the rationale. Context and permission is a great technique in terms of how to ask those kinds of questions even. Uh, when, and I think that works for all people, but it's particularly good for the high S's of the world. And then you can go and prepare your listing. Like you're not going through the whole marketing presentation page by page if they, if you know that they're a D. They don't if, you, if you're a high D, man, you better have the best, everything you need better than be the first five slides. And, and, and here's the thing, um, you got to be willing to, to flex, right? And the challenge is that you have a husband and wife and opposites attract. So a high D is married to a high S and a high I is married to a high C. And your goal is to start to figure out how do I connect in such a way that everybody feels connected to, right? That's why we get paid, guys. This is not easy. It's not, it's not easy to do this. There is so much emotional intelligence involved in sales. Go buy Jeb Blunt's book. It's back on my shelf here. It's called Sales EQ. Jeb is, is, is the, probably one of the best sales trainers in the universe. 
probably the most sought after and hired sales trainer. He's written dozens of books. He's not a real estate guy per se. His name is Jeb, J-E-B, and Blunt, B-L-O-U-N-T. And he's got great books, fanatical prospecting, virtual selling, lots and lots of good ones. But his book, Sales EQ, is all about the emotional intelligence that's required to really be a, a ninja in this industry. That is a really good read. And I encourage you to check it out. All right, guys, we're a little bit over time. I'm comfortable. I don't have anything on my calendar for a little bit now, so I can stay. But if you need to go, go for it. But if there's any other questions, I can hang for a few more minutes. Hey, Hal, I have a yeah. quick question. Go ahead. Where, where can we take the uh, DIS assessment? Um, there's a couple different ways to go after it. Um, you can go, Stella, what office are you in? Ridgewood. You're in Ridgewood. Reach out to Mary Beth Olive, I think. I think all of the offices have access to a DISC assessment that's done through a company called People Keys. And I think they can give you that assessment to do online. I actually, like I said, I'm a DISC trainer for the Maxwell organization. But in order for me to, to do the one that we do, I'd, I would have to charge you for it. Mary Beth can get you one that you can do online and that you can do it for free. Great. Right? Thank you so much. And the other places you can do these, Tony Robbins. If you go to Tony Robbins' website, right, the great per personal motivation guru, yeah. you can go to Tony Robbins' website and you can do a disc on his website for free. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, the thing about these discs, though, is that they come through different lenses. For example, the People Keys disc, I think, is going to be really geared towards how does behavior show up in a work-related environment? The one that I do through Maxwell, because we're a leadership and training organization, it's a, it's a disc through the lens of <clears throat> how does behavior show up in your leadership? Got it. Mm -hmm. Tony Robbins, because he's personal development, his disc will be focused on how does it show up in your life and relationships? Oh, yeah. Right? Cool. So, so while, there's, while there's, there's, you know, these same principles, these, these tools are sort of uh, tweaked a little bit. And the one that you'll do with Mary Beth is more business related, probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great information. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. I'm happy to share it with you guys. I have All right, Hal. So a, uh, a detail-oriented, a high seek gives you a call. How do we improve our conversion before the meeting? Before the uh, listing appointment? Yeah, so what do we do start? before? No, before we do the face-to-face, -face, what are different ways that we can do to improve our conversion? With that person because those detail oriented those uh physicists those accountants those engineers they need a lot of information they want to know everything about everything before yeah, they have, make it a decision. Ready. have it ready so maybe we can uh send them information yeah, prior to that it, right. have have it ready in advance have your fact sheets queued up and ready to go you know what are the yeah. things that you need to know to buy a house in in this market and and it has to be a lot of data how many homes are on the market what's the absorption rate look like how is it trending what's happening with interest rates all the things that are going to be material in terms of them having success have that stuff kind of queued up and ready to go and send it to them in advance because they're going to need to devour that before you show up for sure i like real life examples i know you do that's why i love having you on these calls buddy all right anything else if not, guys, I hope there was some value in this for you. 